everyone. This is fun to be here. I'm um, embarrassed that it's taken me so long to actually come to this event. Um, so Lauren is to a very long history of working in the Santa Cruz watershed, and a lot of our early work actually started in San Rafael Valley and Las Cienegas and uh, San Diego Creek. So, uh, but more recently, our work is focused on the Santa Cruz River and the upland dependent stretches of the river. And today I'm going to just focus on the Living River Project on the lower Santa Cruz, up up there. So we're we're again um, down here. Think you got that right? Yeah, we're up here, okay. um, so up in this northern part of the watershed, um, Smolin Institute has been partnering with Pima County for the last three or four years now on on this project. So, kind of a repetition of what other people have said today, you know, water is life, and um, riparian areas are really important across Arizona, they don't represent a huge part of our landscape, and yet they have all this great biodiversity. And I think this is a 2010 map of, from TNC that um, maps the flow status of all of our perennial waters, and you can see that a lot of our perennial waters um, became formerly perennial because of damming and regulation. So the green are our regular, regulated rivers. Um, and then we have these formerly perennial stretches downstream. Um, but we also have, which actually don't come up as much on this particular map, um, um, effluent dominated stretches that are um, not natural, but they're recreating our flowing stretches of, of river. And just to zoom in on the Santa Cruz, the Santa Cruz has two stretches that are effluent dominated now, and um, according to this map, may have been formerly perennial. I know this stretch in Santa Cruz County was definitely um, had perennial stretches in that red section. I'm not totally sure about here, but definitely we had perennial stretches. Um, uh, near there. But the, this, we put our wastewater treatment facilities on the edge of town, so that's why that location um, exists. So, uh, while it's not totally natural, we have these amazing stretches of river that still have flowing waters. And hopefully this is not a surprise to everyone here that the river does look like this in the Tucson area. This is just last year near Ina Road, and you know it's too easy to think that the river has died because you see dry stretches everywhere, but it's actually still a living entity that we can choose to um, manage and choose to keep our effluent in the river if we want to. Um, so this is just one image there. And then so while most of the water is effluent, we do still get big flood events. This is actually near uh, downtown, I'm not sure what year. Um, so we still get water from storm storms, but most of the water flowing in that stretch is effluent. So the lower Spanish Cruz has been identified by city county study um, in 2011 that it's an important riparian habitat that we should manage, and not just for wildlife, but also it's becoming an important um, amenity to the community. There's amazing recreation opportunities now along the river. We have the Loop Recreation Trail. There's numerous parks. And so what was once kind of this hard to access, somewhat blighted area that some might say, um, it's becoming um, more of an amenity. And a lot of that is thanks to having the effluent flowing in the river to create this green ribbon. So um, with effluent, of course, there are challenges with water quality. And so this is a chart to show you um, the pollutant removal efficiency prior to recent upgrades of the two treatment plants that release effluent into the stretch of the river. And so, um, oops. Um, so um, the original names of both treatment plants were the Ina Road and Roger Road. Um, and compared to newer facilities in, in the other parts of the region, 
uh, you can see that they didn't have as high efficiency removing nutrients, which are naturally much higher in our wastewater. Um, and if the system becomes overloaded, then the efficiency goes down even more. But the treatment plants were recently upgraded, and so we know that water quality is improving. And so these same four um, parameters, the red is the before upgrade values, and the blue is the after values for both, uh, both treatment plants. And I'm just realizing these have now inverted. So now we have, um, um, this is the, the new headwaters of the Lower Santa Cruz. This is the Roger Road facility, which is now the Agua Nueva facility. It's a completely new facility. It was so um, old it needed to just be completely rebuilt. And then the Ina Road is now Trace Rios. Um, I believe they used some of existing infrastructure, but updated it. So you can see huge improvements in um, uh, nutrient removal, and so we know we're going to have higher water quality. But how do we document these changes, and more importantly, how do we communicate these changes so that the community can A, know about them, and appreciate this investment, this is a $600 million investment to upgrade both of these treatment plants. Um, and these are just completed uh, in December of 2013. So similar just to happen to uh, start the Living River model on the Upper Santa Cruz, which is the effluent dependent stretch in Santa Cruz County. And we developed this Living River series, an annual report that tracks 10 indicators of river health. And we just happened to catch the changes due to the upgrade of the Nogales wastewater treatment plant. And it worked really well. We saw some great improvements that we were able to um, document and communicate. And so, Using this model, we launched the Living River Project with King County um, in 2012 to specifically try to capture those changes and communicate them. And because it's a new, a different stretch of the river, um, we didn't just use the same indicators. We kind of used the model but started over and, and worked with <coughs> committee to figure out, okay, what should we include in this Living River series? So the project has several components. We have um, a summary of past wetland conditions, so a compilation of all the past data, um, a detailed report of all the discussions that we had about what to include in our indicators if we really want to get into the weeds. And then, um, we developed the annual report, and that's really what I'm going to focus on today. But all of these reports um, are available on our, this is a, a, web, a link that will take you to the Sonoran Institute website. So um, the before report, so we'll focus on the 2013 water year. I have copies up here. I also have copies of the second report for the Upper Santa Cruz. Um, uh, we released last year, and it was specifically designed to be very um, accessible to a wide variety of audiences. So um, we have visual summaries of the data for all the indicators, and then online we have links that are, if you're looking at a digital version, they're hard um, live links or easily typable links if you're looking at the hard copy. But online we have all these extra data summaries for those of you that want to actually see the, all the data points. And over time, this is the place where you'll see the year-to-year -year, um, data trends. And the next report is coming out very, very soon, as in uh, we're sending out the press release on Monday. <laughs> um, but um, I will highlight what we're finding in both reports today. So just to orient you guys to the Lower Santa Cruz, we have, we're studying a 23 mile stretch from Agua Nueva, which is near Sweetwater Wetlands, all the way to Trico Road. Um, and it, we've broken it into three reaches um, that differ in 
in hydrology and, and land use, we have a more urban, industrial, more channelized section that transitions to a more rural agriculture, wider open floodplain. And what exactly are we tracking? So the original series only had 10 indicators, but this series actually has 16 indicators that fall into six categories. And a new category um, that we didn't even consider on the upper Santa Cruz is more of a social component, and that um, is reflected by odor at the reclamation facilities. Odor, changes in odor doesn't really, as far as I know, impact you know, the ecology and health of the river. Um, but it's really critical for perception of the river and whether we're enjoying being at the river. <laughs> so that was determined to be a, a key social um, impact to track. Um, as well as um, the obvious ones of water quality, water clarity, flow extent. Um, we're measuring the wild, some wildlife um, directly and then riparian vegetation. And I won't have time to go into all of the results for all 16 indicators, but I'm going to touch on all, all of these categories and what changes we've seen between the baseline report and the report that's coming out this week. So in terms of water clarity, it was improved you know, almost overnight. We saw that on the upper Santa Cruz as well. So it used to be with the high nutrient loading, it was very cloudy, murky in a lot of places. And then this isn't the exact same location, but um, it's definitely a much clearer river. And what you can capture in a photograph is the improvements in odor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I didn't include it in this PowerPoint, but uh, the odor in, um, density and or intensity and extent was mapped during the upgrade process, and it's significantly reduced. And um, I heard a lot of people saying, "Oh yeah, I can't even smell anything now." And it, you know, as you were driving into Tucson, you used to know when you arrived yeah. to Tucson. <laughs> close to the river or just recreating along the river. In terms of water quality, um, that previous slide already um, hinted at the fact that the nutrients were down, but just to focus on ammonia, which is our one of our indicators, um, this is the, the averages for the three reaches, and you can see it was quite high, um, particularly in three rivers, which again, the treatment plants that I wouldn't be able to replace was our older, yeah. antiquated. Um, so it really had the bad water quality. And if we look at what we're seeing in 2014, mm -hmm. huge, huge reductions. And this is actually going to improve more because um, the water year starts in September and the final, everything wasn't completely online until December of 2013. So. Um, the 2014 water year includes a little bit of that time. Which is really good news for fish. Um, so in terms of flow extent, so just a general measure of you know, how much water we have in the system, the aquatic habitat available. Um, we're looking at two things. We're looking at miles of flow, and that's specifically measured in June prior to the monsoon season. And then we're looking at kind of look at a daily estimate of how much water um, is dry days at the very end. So what's our maximum length of river that we have on a daily basis? And this is actually a, a category that we didn't include at all in the upper Santa Cruz too, but after working on this, I'm now interested in trying to add that to the original series. So um, in terms of miles of flow, we're seeing fewer miles of flow in June. Um, in 2013, water year, we had 100% of all three reaches flowing from start to the end of Trico Road. And in 2014, so June, the six months or so after the upgrades went online, we already had a dry spot right before Ina Road near Trace Rios, and then a dry spot down. Um, 
at the end um, your trifle road. Um, so shortening of, of the river, and if we look at um, number of dry days, so how many days was the river flowing, I guess not 100% from start to finish, but at least making it all the way down to Trico Road. In 2013, we had zero days when it was dry at Trico Road. So 100% of the time, we had flow measured at Trico Road. And in 2014, we had 94 days when there was no flow at Trico Road. Um, unfortunately, there's not a string gauge right here, <laughs> so we can measure. Um, that uh, new dry spot is the same as well. But, um, so basically what this points to is we have a lot of increased infiltration um, to the higher water quality. And the two, this stretch of the river has two managed recharge projects and they have documented um, substantial increase in recharge. They estimate that 16,000 acre feet were recharged in 2013 and in comparison uh, 29,000 in 2014, so a pretty big jump. Uh, just to uh, point out this next photo, if you keep an eye on this yellow railing, um, <coughs> that's good orientation for this photo. So we're looking now upstream instead of downstream, but here's the same yellow railing. Well, this was a giant flood in September of 2014, and the floods definitely are, are key for churning up the river bottom and increasing infiltration, but this actually came at the end of the water year, so a lot of that infiltration happened um, already before. But this resulted in lots of changes that I won't have time to get into. Um, in terms of our wildlife, aquatic wildlife, we're looking at both fish and macro And in terms of fish, well, we're excited because we're seeing fish, but they are mosquito fish, so there's no native species yet, but... <laughs> <laughs> they got some pupfish here, you can bring home. I know, so... I'm going to introduce fish again. Um, so the reason I'm excited is because on the Upper Santa Cruz, when we started the series, we literally didn't have any fish, and then the mosquito fish weren't even there, so it's exciting to see that both years there were mosquito fish but we actually um, had a slight expansion, um, whereas Three Rivers didn't have any fish the first year, and this year, this past fall, we had two fish. <laughs> so, might be that that big flood in September actually knocked back some of the numbers, because I don't know if you guys recall hearing the news, and last spring, about a year ago, um, there was news of catfish and carp in the river, and we actually didn't see any of that um, in our fish survey, so it could be that they were actually washed down the stream, too. Um, but I'm hoping that longfin days and others might get washed in, or someone might want to plant some native fish. <laughs> yeah, I speak on the online No, I mean that I, I've been told that the idea of actually reintroducing fish on the on the main stem of the river would probably be less likely just because it's so hard to control everything else and keep them out. So we do have gold frogs on this stretch. But we also have some online turtles. Um, in terms of macroinvertebrates, um, so these are the species that tend to be more pollution tolerant. Um, and then we also have pollution sensitive species. And so we would expect these to increase with the improvements in water quality and what are we initially seeing. Um, so it just, if you pay attention to the colors, um, blue are our pollution tolerant species that were highlighted. So we definitely, they were very dominated, dominant in 2013 and decreased a little bit in 2014. And um, though our caddis flies are absent in 2014, we actually had greater main flies and we had some damsel flies and overall had much more diversity. And this was only, you know, in the spring, a few months after 
about four months after the um, treatment plant changed. And so this shows some improvements, though, if you compare this to a, a warm water stream with non-effluent flows, uh, it actually is still considered impaired. But So it might not be that we can ever compare to a warm water stream, but definitely exciting to see this improvement. Um, in terms of riparian vegetation, um, we are looking at several things today, just going to focus on. Um, whether plants along the stream side are more upland type plants or whether they're more wetland plants so they need more consistent water availability and then if they like more low nitrogen conditions or high nitrogen conditions so one's getting that um, water conditions and the other is getting at changes in water quality and so far between the two years we're not seeing any change so just Upstream, there's a sample site where all the plants along the stream have been mainly upland plants and plants that tolerate lower levels of nitrogen. As soon as you add water to the river, we get this switch to more wetland plants and more high nitrogen plants. But again, these were measured in the spring, so maybe there's a lag time with the response of plants, and these were measured I think, before the dry stretch happened along the river. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see what this most recent spring data shows. Uh, birds are not an official indicator, but they, um, this stretch of the river is an amazing bird investigation. And just from one data set, eBird, that's managed by Cornell Lab of Ornithology, we had over 80,000 citizen science um, mm -hmm. observations mm -hmm. in the, over two years, so that's really a lot of them were at the Sweetwater Wetlands, but they're actually from the entire length of the river. Um, so, teaser to with some of the data, and you can come get your hard copy of the report. We're having a, a celebration um, in two weeks, and Sea Watershed Partnership will actually be there tabling as well as some other organizations. Um, you can also See the full Living River of Words exhibit, which is a youth art poetry exhibit. Um, if you don't know about it, it's the amazing um, brings kids to the river that hasn't that haven't seen a full river. And if you want to stay later, um, David Fish is coming for that or that's and Bucks. So I think I'm out of time. Just acknowledge the EPA as well as King County for um, funding and in-kind support, and of course anyone that supports the Morgan Institute is also supporting our work on the Santa Cruz. And you can find all the publications associated with the Living River Project um, at this website, and I don't know if there's time for questions. showing the water purification, I noticed in the 1930s that there seems to be a lot of algae, and I don't see algae in the contemporary photo. Is that because of lack of uh, hydrogen or whatever? Gosh, it sounds like a university. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mean in terms of like the suspended algae component, or, or the... Well, I don't see this in the 1930 slide. You can see a heavy presence of algae. Yes, okay, yeah. So a lot of that um, was suspended sediment, but there was also floating algae bits. Yeah. And, and I think that there's not as much attached algae. We know that. Um, and it, there's the, the whole clarity of the water is improved. And so some of it has to do with like, reduction in attached algae, but I'm not sure, and then there's lower nutrients, we know that, so there's less maybe for them to feast on. I'm not sure that we really know the answer. Yeah, and I don't, I, I forget if that's being measured at all. I, mean, it's like, I don't think so. Yeah, we're not. It could have just been a difference of the site. We still have five weeks like this. And I forgot to say that, you know, this model, oh, while sorry. it's being applied to the F1 dependent stretches, it might be something to read <clears> in a different fashion that could help on the Sienega Creek. Wow. And with that, oh, 
Have you seen any change in the bullfrog population in that stretch of the creek? Um, unfortunately, we are not directly looking at that. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. I know they're still there. We saw a lot of um, tadpoles and bullfrogs in the fish survey in the fall. But it's just kind of a little observation. But if you want to <laughs> charge for them, <laughs> I do. I'm sure it would be. In my free time. <laughs> <laughs> okay.